we're one-tenth of one percent of, uh, of the world's population. The countries above us are a billion people, hundreds of millions of people, and we're nine million people, and we rank eighth in the world. And that, there is more than uh, a rationalist triumph here. It's the triumph of the spirit. I'll tell you what it is. It's the triumph of faith. Former Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, is the first Prime Minister to be born in Israel after the country's Declaration of Independence, the still relatively recent reestablishment of the country 74 years ago. The Prime Minister's whole life has been in some way or another centered on and in service to the State of Israel. From mandatory service in the Israeli Defense Force to serving five terms as Prime Minister, more than any other Israeli Prime Minister, and Netanyahu has shown no signs that he is done yet. He's currently in the running for Israel's upcoming election. Back in the 1990s, during his first term, the Prime Minister was foundational in tearing away at the roots of Israel's socialism. From there, his ongoing strategies resulted in fundamentally remaking the country, particularly on economic freedom and military strength. In our episode, Benjamin Netanyahu explains how that happened and what it looks like to continue keeping peace while on the edge of disaster and destruction at all times. Plus, Prime Minister Netanyahu tells us how he's managed his relationship with the United States over the years, especially with our presidents, the profundity of the Jewish people's perseverance, and what Benjamin Netanyahu has on the agenda if indeed he becomes Prime Minister again. Hey, hey, and welcome. This is the Ben Shapiro Show Sunday Special. Prime Minister, thanks so much for joining the show. What an honor. Welcome. I wanted to start by asking you a question that I think a lot of Americans you know, don't know much about, and that is sort of the roots of Zionism. So when people see you, they see frankly, the Jewish state, because the, the simple fact of the matter is you're the longest serving prime minister in the history of the state of Israel, you've served the most years. And so a lot of people don't really understand the fundamental basis of the Jewish state. Is it the Holocaust? Is it Jewish history? How do all these parts tie in? Well, it's first of all, Jewish history. We, we came here, uh, the Jewish people came here with uh, Abraham. Remember Abraham from the Bible? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob? Well, they came here about 3,500 years ago. And this has been our land, the one we've been attached to, for 3,500 years, Jerusalem, our capital, 3,000 years. So we, we uh, uh, basically survived here, thrived here, struggled here for about 2,000 years of these 3,500 years. And then we were kicked out. Uh, people think we were kicked out by the Romans. No, they destroyed Jerusalem, but we still hung around. Uh, but around between the 7th and 9th century in the Arab conquest, we depleted from our land. We lost our land. A lot of people lost their lands. It can happen. But we didn't give up on the dream of coming back to our land and reconstituting our national life, okay? And so we, we constantly said, next year in Jerusalem, next year in Jerusalem, uh, we wanted to come back. We did come back, uh, dripping first, and then much more greater numbers in the 19th century. And in the 20th century, we reformed the state of Israel. So we, are, we defeat the laws of history. The laws of history say you can't come back from uh, expulsion, dispersion, exiles, massacre. You can't. Well, we did. And we came back and reconstituted this extraordinary uh, state that uh, not only serves the Jewish people, but also its non-Jewish uh, citizens who have the, the best standard of living and the only ones who enjoy any civil rights, equal rights, uh, in a very broad radius in the Middle East. I don't know if the Middle East will change. It is changing. We can talk about it. But the state of Israel, I would say, is like a parable that people can overcome the worst odds in history and could fashion a future of brilliance and hope against the overwhelming odds. I think that's the story of Israel. It gives hope to millions, maybe not to, uh, uh, you know, to uh, a small uh, branch in the college campuses of the United States, but millions, hundreds of millions, I would say even billions of people in India and in Asia and in Africa and in Latin America, they understand that Israel gives hope to humanity. It says, you can do it. That sounds like a yes, we can. <laughs> so your family history in the state of Israel is, is amazing. It goes back several generations at this point, And it really starts with your father, who is, who is deeply involved in the Zionist movement and who actually spoke with a lot of very prominent figures in the United States throughout the 1950s. You were telling me before the show that, uh, that he actually had a meeting with, with President Eisenhower at one yeah, point. Yes, he did. Uh, but before that, I'll tell you that my father, at the age of 23, in 1933, wrote that the Holocaust, that's the word he used, the Holocaust, will threaten not only the survival of the Jewish people, but the, the peace of the world everywhere. 
that if rampant anti-Semitism that the Nazis were promoting in 1933, the, the month that Hitler rose, if that is not opposed, it will sweep and engulf the entire world. So he was a, not bad for a 23-year-old. It was a prescient. Uh, he, uh, he thought that we would be imperiled uh, if we don't have a state uh, to uh, stop, to get the Jews out from Europe, the Jewish people from Europe, they would be destroyed by Nazism. So he wanted to persuade uh, the, the world that there is a need to do the, to make the Jewish state. He went to Jabotinsky, who was the founder of my movement. Uh, he was 60 years old. He was in London. And uh, he was agitating to persuade Britain to, uh, to uh, uh, recognize the Jewish state, which they refused to do. They closed the gates of this country. They wouldn't allow Jewish immigration. They were against the Arabs. And my father went to Jabotinsky in London. He said, you have the right idea, but you're in the wrong place. And he said, why? He said, because you should be in America. He said, why America? He said, because America will be the rising power in the world. There may be a world conflict. America will emerge as the great power, and America can make Britain do what Britain doesn't want to do. That is, recognize a Jewish state. Well, they went to America. Jabotinsky died, and my father continued alone during the interwar, uh, during the war years, agitating for Zionism. He was all of 32. And he began, that's in 1942. He decided to do something that no Jewish leader did before. He went to the Republicans. And he went to Senator Taft, was a very great senator, because Roosevelt would not hear of a Jewish state. He was absolutely opposed to it. He didn't want to antagonize the British. He thought that the British wanted to cater to the Arabs. He, was, he simply would not do it. He was a great leader, but it was for, for the Jewish people, <laughs> that wasn't good. So not being able to persuade the Democrats, he went to the Republicans. And he said to Senator Taft uh, to, uh, to advocate, to put in the Republican National Convention on the platform, Support for unrestricted Jewish immigration and a Jewish state. Well, Roosevelt didn't like it, but three months later, he had no choice. The Democratic uh, National Convention adopted a similar <laughs> platform. So in many ways, my father was the progenitor of the bipartisan American support for Israel. Uh, uh, but uh, of course, he didn't just work on, on public opinion, uh, but he worked on also on the, uh, on the generals and on the politicians. And he went from one to the other. Claire Booth Luce, the wife of, uh, uh, of uh, the publisher of Time magazine, who was a congresswoman, brilliant woman, she opened doors for him. And so he was taken first to the lowest official in the State Department. His name was Lloyd Henderson. He was responsible for the Middle East. And they started bringing him up. Uh, they, they brought him to Dean Acheson, who was the acting uh, Secretary of State. And eventually they brought him to Eisenhower. After the war, he was the uh, commander of the army. Okay. And they heard from him something that they never heard before. Never heard before. And Eisenhower asked him, why should we support you? He said, because the war has ended. The Soviet Union is going to walk into the Middle East. The Arab countries are not only not going to be an obstacle, they'll cooperate with them. And we, in the Jewish state of Israel, will be the bastion of the West. Bastion of Western interests and Western values in the heart of the Middle East to block the Soviet uh, takeover of the Middle East. And Eisenhower looked at him. Eisenhower was very, my father describes him as a sort of very open-minded, very logical American patriot. So he asked him, how are you going to be the, <laughs> the bastion? You're only 600,000. And my father said to him, General, you've just seen in two world wars how we Jews fight for others. Can you imagine how strong we'll be when we fight for ourselves? Well, Eisenhower was uh, very much uh, impressed by that because he got the whole general staff for a second meeting with my father, and he wanted to have a third meeting with the British envoy to persuade Britain to change their attitudes. The Brits nixed that, but it tells you his perspective. Uh, you work on public opinion and you work on the officials. Public opinion, you appeal to justice. Officials, you appeal to interests. <laughs> and the two merge. Well, obviously, you've taken up a lot of those lessons in your own career. So you can see the, the transition and the transformation of the state of Israel. I've only visited the state of Israel four times uh, over the course of my life. I visited first in 2000. It was during the second intifada. And then I visited when I got married in 2008. And I visited three years ago and now. And you can see the massive transformations that have happened over the course of that time period. 
in large part thanks to the fact that, that you, as the finance minister and then as the prime minister, made such economic decisions in, in the state of Israel. The, this, this, the growth here is just extraordinary. Well, the first thing I look at it, when I land in any country, and I can tell you immediately what their GDP per capita is, I look at the roads <laughs> and I look at the cranes. <laughs> in Israel, you can see a lot of that. But of course, the high tech and the other things that are happening here are mesmerizing. I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, but the two most robust centers of innovation in the world today are Miami. No offense to Silicon Valley, it's great, but it's Miami and it's Tel Aviv. Uh, but you know that innovation doesn't do it by itself. That is science, technology, education do not produce wealth by themselves. Because if that were the case, then the Soviet Union would have been, you know, the most uh, wealthy country in the world because they had fantastic uh, scientists, mathematicians, physicists, metallurgists. Didn't help, okay? Uh, to do that, you, you have to have free markets. Technology without free markets doesn't take you anywhere. It just makes people migrate to countries with free markets. Free markets and technology can explode, which is what you're seeing here. My uh, mission uh, was to, if my father's generation was to ensure the creation of the Jewish state, my generation's uh, uh, responsibility, as I saw it, was to ensure its future. And the only way you can ensure its future would be to have it powerful. What does powerful mean? The first thing you have to do is to have an army. <laughs> the ability to defend yourself, which is what the Jewish people lacked when they didn't have a state and they were butchered on, uh, without end. Well, what do you need for an army? Well, you need tanks. That's been replaced by drones. You need, uh, you, you need uh, airplanes, F-35s. You need submarines. You need uh, uh, military intelligence. You need, it's very expensive. All these things have one thing in common. They're very expensive. Now, how are you going to pay for that? Well, the Reagan thinking was, that's easy. You tax the people, you get the money. Right. Uh, I, no, that's wrong. <laughs> okay. The only way you pay for that is with a robust economy. And the only economies that work are free market economies. That was my idea. And the idea was that with that, with a free market economy, you can then build a very powerful military and military intelligence. And now you create both civilian technology, military technology, and you become now something that people are interested in. You don't go and beg for countries to come and help you. They come to you to help them. Uh, and that creates a third uh, uh, apex of the triangle, which is the diplomatic flowering, flourishing of Israel. So my idea was fix the economy, get a strong military, and get uh, a strong uh, diplomatic position. That will get you peace. Strength gets you peace, not weakness. Well, that's easier said than done. First of all, it's not so easy said. <laughs> People didn't believe it. You know, they basically believe, well, you know, we'll get, uh, we'll solve our problem if we make peace. And if we need to make peace, we, we have to make concessions that will make us weak. It's still worth it. In other words, they believe that peace produces strength. I believe that strength produces peace, especially in our part of the world. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not strong, you disappear. You're devoured. Uh, so I had to effect a free market revolution here. That's really what I did as both as prime minister and as finance minister. So in a second, I want to ask you exactly how you affected that revolution, because the origins of the state of Israel, at least at its foundation, was, was a socialist state, right. and it still has a lot of carryover from that period to now. A lot of the holdups in, in the regulatory sphere uh, maintain. So let's talk about how you effectuate an economic revolution in a country that's had no history of this. So you were telling me that the Origins of the Zionist movement were actually pretty capitalist in, yeah. in nature, but the the history that the word taught when I was in Jewish day school is that the foundation of the state was kibbutzim. It was it was essentially communism, uh, and that eventually the, what what you were able to effectuate is this free market transformation that's allowed for innovation and investment. How do you do that, especially in a coalition system where there are so many people who want their piece of the pie? Well, you're right that the uh, the founder of Mond in Zionism, Herzl, was a free marketeer, but uh, with his death in 1904, the the Zionist movement was gradually overtaken by uh, people with socialist views, and Israel became a, a semi-socialist, if not a fully socialist country, and had to wean it. Maybe, you know, in the beginning, to build roads, to do the infrastructure, I don't think so, but you could argue that you, uh, you can have uh, the state do it. But by the mid-60s, uh, you know, it was uh, already congealing uh, 
into a bad thing with bureaucracy, taxes, unions, um, you know, all, all the things that stunt growth. And I always believed that. I thought, well, how do I change it? Uh, to change it, uh, first of all, you have to believe it and understand it. And I had an economics, a secret economics education because I went to uh, the business school at MIT and then at uh, uh, Boston Consulting Group. So I had, a, I had a pretty clear idea what I wanted to do. People didn't associate it with me because I was the ambassador to the UN. I say this, by the way, in my memoirs, I describe this, uh, this transformation. But I grew up with a free market view. I grew up with uh, uh, a skepticism about socialism. I grew up with an appreciation from my father uh, about the value of uh, individual initiative and enterprise. So the, the problem is that the country was here and I was there. How do you get it from here to there? Well, uh, use a crisis. On that one, the Clintonites were right. <laughs> <laughs> Never let a, a good crisis go to waste. Well, I began that actually in 96 when I came in. And the first thing that I did was I liberalized the currency, foreign exchange currency. You know what that, Israel, you couldn't take out more than a few thousand dollars. You'd have to get approval from the central bank. Uh, a guy wanted to get a, a news, remember there was a magazine called mm -hmm. Newsweek? Well, they had a subscription, you had to pay it in dollars. You had to go to the central bank, get clearance for dollars for a Newsweek subscription. That was crazy. There was a, a black market uh, street here called uh, 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 that that was uh, used for uh, 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 for uh, black marketeering and, and funds and so on. And I decided to break it. When I got elected first time in '96, I said we're going to open up the currency markets. They said, Prime Minister, are you crazy? Do you know what happened in Mexico? The peso collapsed. A mountain of money moved out. I said, Well, yeah, but I believe in this, so I did it. And you know what, what happened is a mountain of money did move, but didn't move out. It mm. moved in because money, trade, investments, they go to the free markets uh, and not to the closed markets. Uh, that was the first instance. But the real opportunity I got to change the economy was in 2003 when I became finance minister. I lost the elections, came back to politics after a wonderful three years. A couple of years was great, <laughs> the best years. There are, there, there, are, there are suggestions that you're putting the finance ministry specifically to fail. Yes, I was, but so what? <laughs> and, and they told me, no, and, and I, I described this in my book. They yeah. said, my advisors, many of them said to me, you know, Sharon was the prime minister. Israel is in the deepest economic crisis in decades. And he offers me the finance ministry. <laughs> and I'm the potential heir. And they said, prime minister, take any ministry. Do not take the finance ministry, because you won't be prime minister. To which I answered, well, why do I want to be prime minister? I want to be prime minister to affect my vision, which means a very strong free market economy, uh, and to stop Iran, which is something else, the, the other great thing, and to achieve peace, uh, a real peace, peace based on strength. Uh, so at least one of my principal goals I can achieve, uh, and if I won't be prime minister, so what? I'll achieve one of the goals that I that I can. So I went into the finance ministry, found a huge crisis, huge. I mean, enormous deficits, enormous unemployment, enormous, and everything was bad. Okay. And I thought, well, how am I going to, how am I going to take them from here to there? Okay. Israel uh, didn't have a culture of lemonade stands. You know, it had a culture of the army. Everybody went into the army. So when I thought of presenting my economic plan to the public, I said, well, let's take a vi uh, an image from the army. Now, on the first day that I came to uh, basic training in the paratroops uh, in 1967, the, the company commander put us in a big line and he said, all right, now we're going to take a race, but it's a special kind of a race. So you, Netanyahu, points to me, look to the guy on your right, put him on your shoulders. And the next guy put the guy to you, his right on his shoulders and so on. And then he blew the whistle. I had a guy about my size, it was heavy. I could barely take a few steps. The guy next to me was the smallest guy in the company. He had the biggest guy on his shoulders, and he collapsed. And the third guy was a big guy with a relatively small guy on his shoulders. He took off like a rocket and won the race. And I said to the Israeli public, all global economies are pairs of a public sector sitting on the shoulders of a private sector. In our case, the public sector got too fat. And we're about to collapse like that little guy next to me. 
So we have to put the fat man. It was called Fat Man, Thin Man. <laughs> taxi cab drivers talked about it. It was, it was like the butt of jokes. It was funny. The, the, we have to put the fat man, the public sector, on a strict diet. We have to give oxygen to the guy at the bottom. And we have to remove the obstacle in his way. They said, what is oxygen? I said, oxygen, well, it's many things, but for the first three are lower taxes, lower taxes, lower taxes, because that's what makes people run the race, okay? But even if you had a trimmed down public sector, which is very hard to do politically, because you're cutting public spending, it's very hard, and you have the lower taxes below, the guy begins to run, hits a ditch, crosses the ditch, hits a wall, crosses the wall, hits a fence. These are called barriers to competition. And it could be many things. It could be over-regulation. It could be hidden monopolies, open monopolies. So I proceeded to adopt about 60, 70 major reforms simultaneously, okay, uh, to change that. And we went from 1% contraction of the GDP to plus 5 growth, 5% growth in a year. And it stayed that way for a good decade. And that's the foundation of everything that... You're seeing this explosive growth that you see now. It was hard. I lost uh, politically. My advisors were right. <laughs> I, I, I didn't have a chance to become prime minister. I went down in my votes, but eventually the people appreciated what I did. And Israel is a changed country. There are more. You had a, a, pot, a, a meeting here. Thousands of people came. Are they free marketeers? Yeah, well, 20 years ago, they weren't. <laughs> Well, you know, when, when you talk about the transformation, how it all starts with the economic strength of, of the state of Israel, you can see that also in the Abraham Accords, obviously, right. because it's the economic might of the state of Israel combined with its military might that leads all of these Sunni Arab nations to, to realize that there's common interest. You mentioned that diplomacy is common interest and not necessarily, you know, seeing eye to eye on, on every matter. It's more about you know, where, the, where the commonality lies. And you are obviously the architect of the Abraham Accords, one of the architects of the Abraham Accords, along with the peace partners. And that, that's a, the biggest shift in, in Israeli foreign policy since at least the, the peace with Egypt. Uh, so maybe you can explain how that came about. Well, it, you're right that it had two driving things. Obviously, the Arab countries would benefit from Israel's technology, the explosion of innovation and enterprise, free enterprise that you see here. But uh, it's good you know, for water. It's good for uh, desalination. It's good for... Uh, for uh, the whole digital world, it's good for medicine, it's good for everything. Everything's done here, and they could partake of it, but that wouldn't be enough. The reason they came is uh, because they were afraid of Iran. And when I went to the Congress in 2015, before a joint session of Congress, a uh, joint meeting of Congress, that I spoke there and challenged uh, President Obama's uh, uh, espousal of the dangerous a deal that would effectively pave Iran's way to a nuclear arsenal with gold. I went against the uh, what the so-called JCPOA, the nuclear uh, agreement with Iran. That got their attention in a big way. And we began to have secret meetings. Uh, I think I'm the only Israeli, you know, hundreds of thousands of Israelis have visited the Gulf. Uh, and I'm the only one who didn't see it in daytime. So, <laughs> so we had these meetings and they were... They knew they could rely on me, on my government that I led, that we would do everything in our power to stop Iran from having uh, nuclear weapons. Because if Iran gets nuclear weapons, you know, it's not merely aimed at our destruction, it's aimed at their destruction. It's aimed at you, the United States, because they're developing ICBMs that could reach any city in the United States. And it's not a good idea to have these, uh, uh, you know, Islamic fundamentalist fanatics, this... Uh, uh, Plagocracy, you know, uh, have these nuclear weapons and the ability to threaten American cities. Uh, so, uh, but America didn't see it that way. I saw it that way. They saw it that way. And they relied on us to do it. Uh, so that began the process of thawing out relations with them in a big way. Not yet formal, but I asked, for example, just to, you know, before the Abraham Accords, I asked the, uh, I got the Saudis to allow overflights, Israel over Saudi airspace, well, well before the Abraham Accords. It's part and parcel of this uh, rapprochement, this uh, joining of interests that happened between Israel and the Gulf states. Now, when Trump was elected in 2016, remember, I was in Congress speaking against uh, Obama's nuclear deal in 2015. Now, uh, Trump gets elected president. 
So I came to him and I said, uh, you know, we have four peace treaties waiting to be picked like that. And I suggested to him, I described this in my book, I said, why don't you bring an aircraft carrier to the uh, Red Sea? You know, I remember that Roosevelt had brought Ibn Saud to an American destroyer during World War II. I said, bring an aircraft carrier and invite me and uh, the leaders of Saudi Arabia, the Emirates and Bahrain, and we could get, of course, Egypt and, and Jordan for a summit. And the summit should be to deal with Iran. But that would produce, I said, four peace treaties. I said, there are other countries. I was thinking of Morocco. I was thinking of Sudan. I was already thinking of that. And I, uh, I didn't get very far. I, I, think, I think the president at the time was consumed with the idea of bartering an Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, peace, the art of the deal. <laughs> and uh, as hard as I tried, I, I tried to explain, look, they don't want peace. They, they, they don't want a state next to Israel. They want a state instead of Israel. So we can waste a lot of time trying to get that. Or we can have these peace treaties like that. Well, it took about three years for that realization to sink in, and I'm glad it did because the help of the uh, American administration and Trump was essential for that. But I think we could have already had peace with Saudi Arabia. And if I'm reelected now, I'm going to have peace with Saudi Arabia. And they trust me. They trust me to give the, the, the bulwark against Iran. And if we have peace with Saudi Arabia, effectively the Arab-Israeli conflict is over. Yes, we don't have Yemen. Yes, we don't have Iraq, Syria. That's not important. So my idea was that everybody said, you have to have peace with the Palestinians to get peace with the Arab world. And my idea was the exact opposite. You go to the Arab world, leave the Palestinians to the end, they'll come around, uh, but don't let that, uh, you know, don't let the tail wag the uh, body. <laughs> so in a second, I want to ask you about that potential peace with Saudi Arabia and, and what that would look like, because they clearly are interested in, in making, nor, in, in normalizing relations with, with the state of Israel. I mean, there wouldn't be peace with the UAE and Bahrain if, if Saudi Arabia hadn't signed off on it. You, you don't know how right you are. So let's talk about the possibility of a, of a more durable peace, use the title of one of your books, uh, with, with Saudi Arabia. So the, the Saudis obviously have a, a strong interest in making peace with Israel. They're, they're having to navigate a gauntlet that a lot of the, the Sunni Arab states have to navigate with regard to, for example, the Palestinians. So the, the Abraham Accords essentially says that there will be no annexation of territory for a, for a short period of time or whatever that period of time is, sort of unspecified, uh, and that there'll be normalization of relations. What are the contours of a, of a normalization deal with Saudi Arabia look like? Now, first, a correction. Uh, under the deal that we worked out with Trump, had uh, uh, we would uh, actually, the minute we agreed to the uh, uh, the Trump peace plan, we would be able to apply Israeli law or an ex, in your uh, language, uh, 30%, the critical 30% of Judea Samaria, uh, regardless of whether the Palestinians agreed or not. That didn't quite materialize yet, but that was the actual deal that we worked out. Uh, now you ask a question about uh, what would require, what would be required to make peace with Saudi Arabia? Strong Israeli government that faces Iran, that is not just saying, uh, you know, uh, lip service that well, they're against the agreement because 80% of the public here is <laughs> against the agreement. So, But really to fight it out, go to the UN, go to Congress, go in every possible forum, and then, of course, do the things against Iran's nuclear program, nuclear program. Uh, and we did many things. I can't talk about it, but I can say that uh, we sent, I sent the Mossad into the heart of Tehran to pluck the secret atomic archive that Iran had, and they brought it back. Have you seen Argo, this film Argo? Mm -hmm. yeah, remember? This is Argo on steroids. You know, they took it out. The Iranians are chasing them. They're moving to the next place. You know, the glass almost fell. They almost <laughs> fell. They almost fell, you know? They, they uh, and we got out, they brought half a ton of documentation. And we could prove to the world, Iran, at 2003, you know that what the mission was in these files? Bring five atomic bombs, Hiroshima style bombs in 2003. That's 20 years ago. So Iran, uh, you know, everybody understands that Iran is going to do it and they'll do it with an agreement, without an agreement. The only thing that will stop them is a credible military threat coupled with crippling sanctions, but crippling sanctions are not enough. Credible military threat. And if the threat doesn't work, 
If they're not deterred, then you have to act. The uh, Arab countries, the Arab leaders, trust me to do that. They do not trust the current government. That's the foundation of the peace. They're not going to make peace unless they believe that. Uh, and then everything else follows. And I think, uh, I think there are many other things, but that's the most important one. I mean, ironically, it, it seems as though the Obama administration's sort of full-scale embrace of the Iran deal led to the Abraham Accords in a way, because you know, by, by essentially mobilizing on behalf of the enemies of, of Israel as well as the Sunni Arab states, it forced everybody into this, this coalition against, against Iran. I mean, the well, Obama administration was obviously so antipathetic toward you personally, but also toward the state of Israel more generally. Uh, you know, it's, that, 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 was, that must have been a very difficult relationship to navigate. Well, it wasn't the easiest, <laughs> but but we did. And again, you do that from a position of, of strength. You do that by appealing to America is not a closed country. America is not China. You can you can't appeal to Chinese public opinion because you can't. There's no way to do it. But you can appeal to the American people. You can talk to them. You can say that what is bad for us is also bad for you. Because if you got Iran gets nuclear weapons and uh, the intercontinental ballistic missiles to deliver them to any place uh, in America, that is a clear and present danger to the security of the United States. Uh, you can see what I'm talking about. There is a, a small country that has 5% GDP, maybe 10% of Israel, even though its population is much bigger. It's called North Korea. North Korea develops nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles. Half of Asia is quaking in fear. Everybody is threatened. Japan is threatened. And it's just a question of time, and they, I don't think it's a lot of time. They may already reach it. They can reach Los Angeles. They can reach... Uh, that changes the world. Now, North Korea is 5% of Iran. 5% of Iran's GDP. So if Iran, with its ideology, with its death to America ideology, you know, America is the great Satan, we're the small Satan. I often, uh, uh, you know, poke fun at my European friends. I said, you're a middle-sized Satan. <laughs> not worth it. You know, you can be small, you can be big, but you don't want to be a middle sized city. But that's what they talk about, death to America. You don't want that government, that regime, this, these thugs in uh, Tehran to have uh, the, the means to uh, of mass death in which they can threaten the entire world and America, uh, to which they're absolutely committed to, uh, you know, to fight. Uh, I couldn't get through. I could get through, but I could get through to the American people. I can get through to their representatives in Congress. Uh, and, you know, I, it's not something that, uh, and again, I write about this, it's not something that I did like that, haphazardly or, you know, with a slate of hand. To go into the lion's den, into the American Congress, to go there and challenge a sitting president is a very difficult decision because America is still the indispensable ally. It doesn't make any difference if it's, Democrats or Republicans, it's still the indispensable ally for Israel. And to go and challenge the American president uh, is not something I would lightly do. I did it because I thought that my country's very existence was in peril, that I had to challenge, that if I didn't speak out, I would never forgive myself. And what am I here for? What, to sit on a chair? To earn money? I mean, it's a joke. You go there because this is my mission, to protect the future of Israel. And so I went there. And it was, uh, uh, you know, it was a tough thing, but it kept the flame of the resistance to the nuclear deal uh, alive because nobody's going to defend you if you're not willing to defend yourself. And that obviously changed when the administration changed, and I'm, I was very happy that that change took place uh, under the Trump administration. So looking at Iran and sort of the long-term future for Iran, what do you see as the optimistic possibility for Iran? Because obviously the theocrats in charge there have solidified control over the military. They're spreading their tentacles to significant conventional threats to the state of Israel, including Hezbollah, which is armed with 150,000 rockets, far more sophisticated than anything that Hamas has been firing at, at, at Israeli cities. They're funding Hamas, obviously. Yeah, so, so what do you see as, as a long-term solution for Iran? Because obviously advocates of the JCPOA or a revised JCPOA claim that in the absence of an agreement that essentially Iranian, uh, Iranian extremism plus nuclear weapons is inevitable. No, it's the opposite. It's the, Iran without the nuclear agreement. The, the nuclear agreement merely says that in two, three years, Iran will have unlimited enrichment capacity of uranium, which means that they can create the, uh, the nuclear core for 100 nuclear bombs, a nuclear arsenal. Uh, and that's under the agreement. You agree to it. That's what the agreement says. So, uh, and uh, you give them megabucks to boot. 
So Iran, without the nuclear agreement, is an isolated country, uh, a poor country, and a country that could be subject to uh, military attack by the signatories. Okay, Iran, with the nuclear agreement, is a, a power, rich country, gets hundreds of billions of dollars because of this agreement. Uh, it breaks out of its international isolation, uh, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a country that doesn't really fear any military action from the United States. That's what it means. That's what the nuclear agreement means. It just gives them immunity and prosperity while they're developing a bomb, a nuclear arsenal in two years. So you shouldn't sign this agreement. Uh, in order to stop it, you have to have the willingness to act militarily against Iran's nuclear program and nuclear installations. That's what I have. And I did it. It's not something that I, you know, there are more things to do. Do we have the capacity to do it? The answer is yes, we do. Do we have the will to do it? I have the will to do it. My colleagues have the will to do it with me. Uh, and, and I think this is the, the big test. We have to stop Iran. By the way, if you have that capacity, you won't have to use it in all likelihood. But if you don't have the will, it's meaningless. So I, I think that's, uh, now the question is, all right, but how does Iran change? Will Iran change? Well, these regimes like Iran or North Korea and so on, basically they kill their opponents. You know, they, they govern by killing people, you know. Uh, the reason the Shah fell is because he wasn't willing to kill thousands of people. Mm-hmm. It's not only Jimmy Carter and all of the stuff that you read, it's because he wasn't willing to kill. What these guys discovered is that if you kill, nobody cares. Nobody intervenes, you know. You can see that in many places, okay. So, and they're willing to kill. They kill uh, maybe 1,000, 2,000 people a year, and that's enough to uh, get the point. Uh, how will it change internally? They control information. They control the killing machines. You could possibly decontrol the information. I think that's important. With new technologies, with low-flying satellites, with devices that are the size of a matchbook that are distributed elsewhere, you might break their hold, their monopoly on information. That begins to challenge them. Uh, and uh, but I, you know, there are many other things that I could talk about, but I won't. <laughs> so in a second, I want to ask you about the some of the other threats that I briefly mentioned there to the state of Israel, ranging from the northern border with Hezbollah to the Gaza Strip, and and the continuing threat that still exists in Judea and Samaria. Uh, by the PA. Okay, so let's talk about some of the other threats. So one of the things that I've talked about, so I spoke in Tel Aviv recently, and I I was talking about what Israel could learn from America, what America could learn from Israel. What I said Israel could learn from America was essentially free market economics, many of the things that you've talked about, reducing the regulatory states, so you don't have to call your brother-in-law who went to the Technion to make sure that you can get your passport approved, uh, and and re- revising the way the ju- judiciary is done here because it's it's very odd by American standards. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that in, in a little while, I'm sure. Um, but the, the thing that I said that, that America could learn from Israel is that Israel has a certain level of social solidarity between people who disagree on nearly everything else that just doesn't exist in the United States. And the easiest way to see that is, is the demographic trends in the state of Israel. Tel Aviv, which is a very secular city, the reproduction rate here is 2.3. The reproduction rate in Judea and Samaria is 4.6. The reproduction rate in Haifa is 2.4. You're looking at, at the, the reproduction o- rate in Europe is uh, minus one. It's ex- less than less, that's exactly right. So, I mean, this is the only Western country, literally the only one that has a reproduction rate above replacement averages. Uh, and that is the, the strength of the state of Israel. At the same time, that might be because it does face existential threat on, on all borders. And, and so you're forced into a certain level of social solidarity. So, what do you think of that? And and do you think that you know Israel almost requires, as the Jewish people historically have, a certain level of outside threat in order to reach social solidarity? Well, whether we require it or not, we're getting it. <laughs> so we can test what will happen. You know, I'd like to be tested <laughs> in a country that is not threatened from day one with uh, its survival, uh, with its existence. So, yes, I think that is a, I think it's our history, too. It's our bond to this land. It's the fact that we that a third of our people were uh, incinerated uh, just a few decades ago. I think that creates the wars of Israel. Uh, You know, people have children as a reaffirmation of their hope. Uh, And we're not no longer living in a situation where you have, uh, you know, labor-intensive economies. You have to have 10 kids in order to earn a living. It's the opposite. And yet people in Israel, in the prosperous Israel, Israel is sort of beating the beating the equation because if you're impoverished, you have a lot of kids, but it is, well, you're prosperous and you have a lot of kids and that strengthens our economy even more. Uh, that's, uh, so yes, I think the, the history, 
the experience that we have, the, the life ethos that we have in the Jewish people have come back to life. The Jewish people have come back to life in the state of Israel. So it sort of gives, as I said, hope to, I think, to all people everywhere that you can do this. Uh, and uh, I think that that's where it's going to continue. I don't think it's a, a short-term thing. There is a, a pulsating life force here. Uh, how do we uh, how do we manage the uh, the various uh, uh, the solidarity? Uh, well, the first thing is have free markets, because free markets give you two things: they give you economic growth, they allow the realization of personal potential, but they also give you the money. <laughs> they give you the money on a smaller tax rate. I had to argue this with you. <laughs> I said, you know, you're, we're going to lower tax rates and we're going to have bigger revenues. And they said, no, that can't be. I said, haven't you heard of the, the Laffer curve? And they said, Laufer, who's this Laufer? No, there are non-Jewish economists. <laughs> there is one or two, you know, one non-Jewish economists. Arthur Laffer. Said, you know, if you're at a high rate of taxation and you lower tax rates, you know, you're going to get more tax revenues. And that's easily demonstrable, uh, you know. And, and we're at the very high tax rate. So uh, when you do that, you also get, you fill up the government coffers. So on the one hand, you promote business initiative enterprise. Employment. On the other hand, you get the money to help the poor, uh, the needy, especially the the uh, handicapped, the old people who can't be in the job market, and so on. So there's no conflict between social welfare and free markets. They're absolutely complementary. And in fact, I would say that social welfare depends on free markets. And that's what we installed here. We 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 change the thing, and that creates a measure of solidarity. It doesn't allow the bifurcation of society that happens in so many other places where you don't have free markets. That's when society is really bifurcated. So to return to some of the core threats, Hezbollah is a, is, a, is a threat that pretty much everybody in the world media ignores until the occasional time when Hezbollah starts firing thousands of rockets over the border simultaneously. Uh, this is one of the things that people in northern Israel particularly are significantly worried about. Israel has Iron Dome, but the, the question is, it's extraordinarily expensive to operate Iron Dome. Every one of those anti-missile missiles, essentially, uh, is, is very expensive. Hezbollah has extraordinary numbers of rockets. So what exactly is the plan for Hezbollah, broadly speaking? Well, I'm not going to item. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm not going to ask you to lay out a military. That's not on the first day. <laughs> 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 and not public. But I, I could say this. Uh, I showed uh, President Trump you know, the map of all these missiles embedded against uh, Israel, embedded in, uh, in uh, you know, in civilian neighborhoods and hospitals and so on. Ceiling is moved, boom, a rocket comes out, you know. Uh, and uh, he said, well, God, how do you sleep at night? And I said to him, Donald, I sleep at night by making sure they don't sleep at night. <laughs> and that's basically it. It's, it's, uh, it's both defense, but also uh, offense. Uh, and I really wouldn't get into that. Mm -hmm. But uh, apparently they think, uh, they're concerned with that because they're very careful. Uh, and of course, we, we will surprise them. So surprise is a key element in, in war, which I hope we don't have to fight. So speaking of threats on the border, obviously Hamas, the, the pullout from Gaza, turns out to be, by pretty much every measure, a rather large-scale disaster, considering that Hamas immediately takes over the place and immediately uses it as a base with which to launch attacks into mainland of Israel, like all the way to, all the way to Jerusalem, um, in some of the last rocket attacks. Um, so you know, what, what, what can be done with Hamas? Because the, the reality is that were Hamas to be toppled, which the Israeli military clearly has the power to do, were that to happen, there's a good shot that ISIS would take over. So what happens with a radicalized... Well, and also, you'd have to take over because there's no one else to take over. So we'd have to manage another uh, 2 million Palestinians, and that'll be a drain versus the other fronts that we have, like Iran uh, and Hezbollah and so on. So I, I think event what you do periodically is you restore deterrence powerfully. We just did that uh, a year ago, uh, right before I left office. We destroyed... They, they built... Uh, aerial capacity, we destroyed it. They built a naval capacity, we destroyed it. They built a, a tunnel system to penetrate Israel. We built an underground wall with sensors. Not one tunnel crossed. They built a tunnel network to hide under uh, all of Gaza as defensive tunnels. First time in history, we penetrated that and bombed it. You know, from the time of the Babylonians, people have been digging tunnels both for attacks and for defense, and no one really was able to identify it and hit it from the outside without sending people inside, uh, and we did. So we set them back a good, good, good uh, uh, distance, and you know, it keeps the peace.
But you're not going to get the ultimate peace as long as you have uh, militant Islamists there who are committed to our destruction. Okay, that's just not going to happen. So you have to create a wise policy. And my life has been committed to deterring those who around us, deterring those who wish to destroy us or rolling them back, and making peace with those who don't. And that's basically the, the division. You have to make a division. Uh, the Emirates want to have peace with you. The Bahrainis want to have peace with you. I believe the Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia wants to have peace with us. We've already made peace with Egypt and, and Jordan. Make peace with those who don't want to destroy you and roll back those who do. Uh, Hamas wants to destroy us. Unfortunately, the Palestinian Authority, the, uh, the other wing of, their, uh, of the Palestinian uh, people, they are uh, not committed to, uh, they're, they're committed not to uh, destroying Israel with terror, at least not in the first instance, but for the gradual dissolution of the Jewish state. So that's why we can't make peace with them. We can't make peace with them because they don't want an Israel. They want a peace without Israel. Uh, you divide your policies based on what can realistically be achieved. And my view is that with those who don't want to destroy you and those who do want to destroy you, you have to, have, you have to be very, very strong. If you're strong, you uh, have uh, at least a state of non-belligerence with the people, with the movements like Hamas. And if you're strong, you can make peace with those who are willing to make peace. And that's what we've done. That's what the Abraham Accords are. It's, it's a change. It's a complete change of, all, of the view that says, no, you have to, you have to give uh, the Palestinians who wish to see the end of Israel, give them the hills above Tel Aviv from which they can see the sea into which they want to push us into. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. But that was the regular view. It's changed. You know, this country is different from what you saw 20 years ago. It's different. The skyline in Tel Aviv is different. You've got free markets, free marketeers all over the place. You've got, You've got, this is something that's really going to shock you, okay? <laughs> we, have, we have, they just published uh, in one of these business magazines, the uh, greatest concentration of billionaires per capita in the world. Number one was Hong Kong. I suspect that's going to change. <laughs> and number two is Israel. 20 years ago, that wasn't the case. But since then, you had this multiplication of high-tech entrepreneurs and, and so on. And the, the other thing is people will tell you, you know, critics on the left, they'll say, oh, yeah, but inequality went up. You know, it's uh, the rich got richer, the poor got poor. No, actually, it's the opposite. Because we changed the welfare laws here and so on, and people went to work, the poor got richer. And in fact, the, uh, the inequality in Israel initially went up as we did our market reforms and then went down, 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 down. It's at a 20-year low. So Israel became a very rich country and a more egalitarian country. Without curtailing competition, without curtailing uh, enterprise. It's the opposite. Free markets and social welfare go together with the right policies. That was my policy. So when it comes to the, the Palestinian Authority and, and the, the Oslo Accord, so very early on you were obviously a critic of the Oslo Accords. I think the failure of Oslo has been demonstrated over the course mm -hmm. of the last, most of my lifetime, over the course of the last you're young years. Man. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I was only, I was only, I think, 11, no. uh, 10, 11 when, when the Oslo Accords were signed. Uh, the, the failure of the Oslo Accords uh, is, is pretty apparent to, to everyone, given the fact that these so-called peace partners just don't exist and probably never existed. And we're, we're sort of a figment of the collective imagination right. of many people on the Israeli left. So, you know, given that fact, given the fact that the geography of Israel, for people who have never visited, everything in Israel is extraordinarily close together. Ramallah is essentially within eye line of Jerusalem. You know, is there any plausible long-term, sure. mid-term solution? Sure, and uh, that's actually developed in the uh, uh, in the plan uh, that we discussed with the President Trump, and I think it's a realistic one. It basically says this: okay, the Palestinians in the Palestinian areas can govern themselves. Okay, they can have their parliament, their representatives, their uh, executive uh, can have their flag, and they can have their uh, national anthem. But there are certain sovereign powers they can't have. The rule is simple. They can have all the, the powers to govern themselves and none of the powers to threaten us. Now, that means that, for example, in the tiny area, and you're right, it's a tiny area, Israel and the Palestinian areas together is the Washington Beltway, more or less, okay? That's it, okay? It's a tiny country, okay, tiny area. So west of the Jordan River, which is the, the boundary line, uh, and to at the Mediterranean, where we were both sandwiched in, Israel and Israel alone controls security. We control the airspace, 
We control the ground, uh, ground security, underground security in case they want to do tunnels and electromagnetic space, you name it. Israel alone. Well, I said that uh, over the years. And I said, when people were talking about the vision for peace, I said, there are certain sovereign powers, the most important one being security, we control. And so my friends, including some who run the United States, said to me, but maybe that's not a sovereign country. I said, maybe so. But that's what is going to be, be there because we're not going to commit suicide for uh, an op-ed, a uh, favorable op-ed in the New York Times. It won't last more than five minutes anyway. We're not going to die for uh, uh, an illusory opinion. Now, some of my uh, American colleagues, for example, Secretary of State uh, John Kerry, whom I said this to, said, you know, we can take care of that. We can make sure you can withdraw your security forces from uh, Judea Samaria, the West Bank, as they call it, because we will train the local, the local uh, uh, Palestinian forces to fight the Islamic radicals. John Kerry brought General Allen, John Allen, uh, to show me a plan uh, how this can be done. I was sitting there with our then defense minister, and they explained it. And I, I, we were skeptical, naturally. And so John, who, who's been a close friend, by the way, he said, well, maybe I can prove to you that we can do it. I want to take you on a clandestine visit to Afghanistan, and you will see how we train the Afghan forces to deal with the Taliban. And I said, John, I guarantee you this. The minute you leave Afghanistan, <laughs> it will take at most days, no more than days, for the Taliban to sweep all these American trained forces that you have. Uh, and we're not going to take that risk. We're not going to withdraw our military from Judea, Samaria, and have, uh, have uh, the Islamists, the Iranians, Hamas, take over and destroy the state of Israel. So the real peace that we could have is let them have all the powers to govern themselves, but none of the powers to threaten us. Security, first, before anything else, stays with us. By the way, not only for us, it's for them. <laughs> because the Hamas would overtake the Palestinian Authority in two seconds, which is what happened when we left Gaza. We're not going to do that again. It's not a perfect peace, but it's the, the most the best thing that you could have. So I want to ask you about another threat that Israel faces. This, is, this obviously was an issue that kind of missed the radar in a lot of the West, but was a huge issue here in Israel. That was Israeli Arabs being radicalized enough to actually riot in load during the last crisis with Hamas. So let's talk about the one, one of the key issues that has cropped up for the domestic Israeli population, all, all Israelis, and that is the problem of radicalization of the Arab population inside of Israel. So during this last coalition government, which lasted approximately a year, I was frankly shocked that it lasted that long, the, the, the big kind of pitch to the world is that there was an Arab party that was part of the coalition, the Ra'am party. Uh, and then, of course, the Ra'am party refused to vote in favor of the continuing application of military rule to Jewish settlements, so-called settlements in the West Bank, places like Efrat that have 30,000 citizens. Uh, and the coalition government fell based on that. Now, th there's been you know, a lot of talk for a long time in the West about the treatment of Arabs inside of Israel. Uh, the fact is that obviously the Arab party did sit in, there are several Arab parties actually in Knesset, uh, there was one that was a member of the coalition, but the, the radicalization of, of the Israeli Arab population is of increasing concern. During the last Gaza conflict, one of the biggest problems was this massive riot that happened in Lod, in which there were literally Israeli Arabs walking around attempting to burn synagogues. What can be done to, to, to fight this? I mean, I, I mean, listen, I'm, I'm a relative stranger to Israel. As I say, I've only visited here four times, but you can sense that there's a, a massive difference between the, the, Israeli Arab portions of Jerusalem, for example, and the Jewish areas of Jerusalem. If I'm walking around in Mamilla, there are many Israeli Arabs who are walking around unmolested. If I were to walk with my family wearing my yarmulke down to the Damascus Gate, it would be a serious security problem. So, so how exactly is that gap bridgeable? Well, first of all, correction. The Ram party, you say, was uh, against uh, an item that you mentioned. The, the Ram party is the Muslim Brotherhood Party. They have a governing council, a Shura council, that is of the Muslim Brotherhood, okay? And the Muslim Brotherhood supports Hamas uh, it's, uh, and, and many other uh, uh, radical. And there are no countries in the Middle East, with the exception of Turkey and Qatar. All the Arab countries ban the Muslim Brotherhood. What happened in the last government, in order to uh, eke out a majority, the, the government that promised not to do this, the people who uh, came into power, promised that they wouldn't go with the Muslim Brotherhood, and they promptly violated that promise and brought them into the 
the government, which is unbelievable because they're against the Jewish state. They're against Israel as a Jewish, the nation state of the Jewish people. That's their professed ideology. Sometimes they deliver it in a soft-spoken manner, but that's it. They gave him tons of money, 50 billion shekels, an enormous amount of money. Some of it going through NGOs that are associated with Hamas. It's insane. I mean, this was such a, a violation, uh, not only of campaign promises, but of, of just a common sense. You can't do that. Uh, and that obviously uh, raised uh, expectations of the more radical wing in the Israeli Arab population. Uh, and that expressed itself in these uh, in, in many manifestations that uh, you're talking about. But there's no question, there is a race in the Middle East as a whole and a race inside Israel between what I call are the modernists and the medievalists. Okay, the medievalists want to take you back to militant Islam, to a, really a dark period uh, in the history of the world. And the modernists want to be incorporated in the modern state of Israel to, to partake of the extraordinary success that you see around you. And they have doctors, they have uh, nurses, they have phar pharmacologists, they have uh, high-tech entrepreneurs. They want to be there. The other guys want to take them back, okay, and dissolve the state of Israel or destroy it. Uh, and we have to make sure that the modernists win out over the, uh, the uh, medievalists. My government, you'd be surprised to know, uh, gave uh, an enormous amount of money. And I, you know, wasn't doing it for votes. I did it because I believe in this, in helping the right side on this battle. Uh, enormous amount of money, about uh, 30, 25 billion dollars, a billion shekels, okay? But I gave it not to NGOs, Hamas NGOs. I invested in roads, in infrastructure, in education, uh, in the Arab communities. And I'm a Likud guy, right? By the way, you'd be surprised, I received uh, about 10% of the Arab vote, okay? Actually, today in the, the recent polls, I received, the Likud under me receives more Arab votes than all the Jewish parties together, <laughs> okay? Why? Because many of them want to be a part of this modernization and this success story. And I think if you ask me what is the, the answer to that, I think, yeah, beefing up security against the radicals and against the, uh, you know, against lawbreakers is important. But equally important is you want, to, you want to move them into help as much as you can to give them enterprise, opportunity, education, law, and order that they want in their communities. Uh, and that's the, the program that I began and the program that, God willing, I'll continue when I get in. Uh, it's a big battle. But it's the same battle you see in the Middle East. It's Iran and, uh, in, in Iraq and in Syria and in Yemen as opposed to what is happening in the Gulf. Look at what happened in the Gulf. Look at what happened there. I mean, it's a fantastic example of, of enterprise and initiative. It just changed the whole way people think about the Arab world. And the Arab world has to go there and not not to Yemen, okay? Uh, and Israeli Arabs have to go to here, to what you see around you and not to Yemen. So I, I wanna ask you some questions about the, the state of the West more broadly, because obviously Israel is a key player in the West, in many ways, it's the tip of the sphere in a very unfriendly place in the world. But it seems like the, the international left is obviously increasingly anti-Israel, uh, not just in America, but sort of generally speaking, whether it's Jeremy Corbyn and, and, and the late, the, formerly the head of the Labour Party in the UK, uh, or in multiple parties across the across Europe, it, it seems as though a lot of the ire against Israel is not directed against Israel per se. It's directed against nationalism more broadly. The idea that there should be a nation as part of a nation state, which uh, I think underlies a lot of the rage about the fact that Israel passed a nation state law, recognizing that Israel is a Jewish state, which is what it always said that it, that you know, it was. You know, yeah, with equal rights to everyone, non-Jews. The only thing that you know what the nation state, the, the Jewish state means, that any Jew can come to Israel automatically. That's all, that's really the main thing that it means. Why? Because for thousands of years, or almost uh, 2,000 years, a little less, we were absolutely stateless and countryless, and we paid the biggest price that any people paid in, in the history of mankind, or humanity, as we say today, okay? <laughs> all right? So, you know, so if you're a Jew and you're, you don't have a place to go, you can come to Israel. That's what the nation state means. Inside, everyone's the same. Everyone is the same. There are no differences. Equal under the law. So when, when you talk about the, the Jewish state. And that's the only place, by the way, where Arabs enjoy equality under the law because the rest are non-democracies. And when people condemned Israel as an apartheid, I said, what are you talking about? If you're a Christian or you're a homosexual or you're a woman in the Arab societies, in the Palestinian areas, you live in medieval times. 
You know, in Hamas, people go to support Hamas. Hamas executes people who deviate from the, you know, from the strict uh, rule that they impose, including the Quranic rule. What are you talking about? Israel is the beacon of democracy. Attacked, defending itself, maintaining a democracy inside, the rule of law, equality. What are you, these people? Are, are these people mad? And the answer is, yeah, they're quite mad. <laughs> they're quite mad. It's so obvious. And you know who understands that best? The Arabs. The Arabs understand it. The Arabs around Israel. Uh, you know, I have fan clubs in the Emirates <laughs> <laughs> and in Saudi Arabia. Well, that, that's interesting because they understand it too. They want a better life. It is fascinating how Israel has become sort of the point of contention here. There's no other state on earth where people actually have a conversation about whether it ought to exist or not. Israel seems to be the only one. And in terms of sort of what, what people will accuse Israel of, of ethnic solidarity, despite the fact that, again, Jews are quite diverse. And you have Ethiopian Jews and you have Moroccan Jews like my wife. Yeah, some, some, some apartheid. I brought tens of thousands of, I personally brought tens of thousands of uh, black Jews from Ethiopia to Israel. I mean, it's, the whole thing is, is ridiculous. But, but if you ask me, what is the genesis of the, uh, of the progressive left's antipathy to Israel? It's their antipathy to certain Western values that we hold dear. You talk about uh, uh, nationalism, which by itself is not negative uh, and quite positive. It helps build, you know, communities. It's like, are families bad? Are families bad? You think families are bad? Why? Well, you have, hey, come on. You're preferring your children to other children. That's <laughs> bad. Okay. Well, we know human society is organized around families and the families are organized around nation states. And the nation states, like families, can cooperate with one another. Or, or uh, unfortunately, because human nature is not uniform, they're bad people and they're bad nations. Well, you have to fight the bad and promote the good, right? Uh, that conception of how we organize the world is very different than the progressive left. And I think in many ways they hate Israel because they hate America. All right? Uh, now, if you, hate, if you hate America, you're going to hate Israel. If you love America, you're going to like Israel. And you know who believes that? The Islamists. I mean, what does Iran say? It says, uh, when they attack Israel, they say, we are you, we are you, that means Americans. Israelis are Americans, and Americans are Israelis. In a, in a broad way, they're right. This is, this, these are the values of freedom, of democracy, of individual choice, of uh, pluralism. These ideas are things that are completely anathema to, to them. They want this regimented medieval world. And in a peculiar way, the association of the medievalists and their partners in the West, who are their partners? The progressives join these radical Islam, Islamist radicals in attacking anything that's uh, not only Israelis, but also anything that's Western. It's crazy. So but before we talk about that, I just want to say that we're in the midst of a global crisis, global economic crisis. Uh, and I think that the advantage that we have in Israel, it's a small country, so you can be a nimble mammal <laughs> among the, di the dinosaurs, and you can we weave out of co a conflict, get yourself, extricate yourself from the economic crisis very quickly. In uh, 2003, when we had the, the aftermath of the dot-com collapse, I made this huge program that I talked to you about, the fat man, thin man, these... Uh, 80 so uh, or, or more um, reforms that got Israel first out uh, and produced this spectacular group. Then in 2008, nine, when I came in, we had the subprime uh, uh, global crisis of, uh, you know, and, and you know what I did there? Actually, the opposite. Because our banks were conservative and we weren't, uh, you know, we weren't in, at risk. And I decided to, uh, instead of bailing out companies left and right, I said, well, I'd be bailing out failed companies. Why should I do that? So I went on a much more modest way uh, and gave loan guarantees, very measured. So if you're a failing company, you didn't get the benefit and didn't get the incentive to continue to fail. Uh, and we got out of that one first in the world. Then in 220, when we had the COVID crisis, it wasn't only a health crisis, which we also got out first in the world, but it was an economic crisis. There we had very cheap credit. So I gave uh, a lot of companies that didn't fail, that were just hit by COVID, lifted them out. And I think that there is a way to deal with the global inflation problem uh, in a way that Israel uniquely is able to do. And I'm keeping that for my election. I'll tell you about it <laughs> well, that is Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. You should check out his brand new memoir. Bibi is not out yet. When it is, it's going to be a must buy. Prime Minister, it's an honor to sit with you. Thank you. Good to talk to you.